There's a famous Rambam. There's a famous Rambam in Pirkei Avos that explains that if a person is able to do one mitzvah or do multiple mitzvahs, for instance, let's say you have a hundred pennies and you want to put, which is a dollar, and you want to put the hundred pennies in the charity box. Each penny you put in the box is another act of doing charity. If you put a dollar bill or four quarters or half a dollar, two actions is, is, is the dollar. Four quarters is four actions. 20 nickels is 20 actions. Pennies, it's 100 actions. Every time a person engages in a mitzvah, you do, you're actually conditioning yourself to do a mitzvah. Because a human being is what is a creature of habit. And whatever habit we assume, whatever conditioning process we assume, that's what we become. That impacts and creates second nature. That's the nature of a human being. So Ramam says, each time you do it, you're conditioning yourself to do whatever you're doing, to do the mitzvah. But in addition, when we do a mitzvah, it's an act of sanctification. We say on, on the bracha, the blessing before we do a mitzvah, you've sanctified us through your mitzvahs. So every time you do a mitzvah, it's an additional act of sanctification. The Gemara tells us in Brochos that when one prays, you should always pray in the same location that you always pray. If you pray in a, in a shul, in a synagogue, you should always have your designated location that you pray. In Hebrew, it's called Mokam Kavor. You have your set place where you pray. Now, why is that so important? So the Gemara tells us, very interesting, that a person, where do, who, where do we find that he prayed in the same location. It's in the Torah. We find that initially when Avram was informed that he was Hashem was going to destroy Sodom, he entered into a dialogue with him to maybe to avert the destruction of Sodom and Amora. And so maybe the 50 righteous people, 45 righteous people, 4, 30, 40, till God says, there's no righteous. Once it was over. Avram walks away. The next day, Avram, it says, he came to that same location. And he saw smoke billowing up, which was an indication. Stob and Amora, those communities were destroyed. Cosmic destruction. It says, Vayamo b'moko m'sher omat. He stood in the same location that he was there the previous day. So here we see that when you pray, you should always pray in the same location that initially you prayed. And the Gemara says something interesting. Call a kovea mokum tefiloso. That a person always chooses to pray in the same location when he passes away. They say about that person, He's devoutly righteous and he's humble. He's humble. He's from the students of Avram Avinu. So the question is, if you always insist to pray in the same location and you're careful when you pay, first place away they say he's a chosid, he's devoutly righteous it's not that difficult and not, you're humble how does that somehow display humility and not and what and you're from the students of Avram as Avram we see prayed in the same location assuming his mode of behavior you become a student what's it all about so the noted Yehuda he has a commentary on Masechus Baruchus. It's called Tzlach. And he writes over there a very interesting concept. If a person goes and you take an ordinary velvet bag and you put your tefillin in that bag and you want the bag should be the location for your tefillin and then you choose to take them out, that bag assumes the identical state of sanctity as the tefillin. That since the, the bag was used as the location for the tefillin to be, the bag assumes the sanctity of the tefillin. Now, if you want to dispose of that bag, you can't dispose of it as an ordinary cloth bag. 
the bag has to be buried. Just as tefillin, if they become invalidated, they have to be buried because they have an innate holiness. The bag that that uh, accommodated those tefillin assumed the identical status of the bag. It's called Tashmish Kedusha. Because it actually accommodated something which was innately holy. That's what it is. The Gemara tells us that if a person's present, when another Jew passes away, he has to rent his garments. It's called, at the time of Yitzhiyas Neshama, when the soul departs from a person, if another Jew's present, that person has an obligation to rent his garments. Why? So the Gemara says, it's like, God forbid, if a person would see a safe, the Torah being burnt. Being burnt, you have an obligation to, to take Kriya, to take, rent your garments. Why? Because since the Sefer Torah is filled with names of Hashem, and the name of God is being desecrated by being burnt, when you witness that level of desecration of God's name, that it no longer exists. One has to express an expression of pain, and how does he express it? Express it? Tearing his garments, renting his garments. So Rashi explains, what is the soul of a Jew? The soul of a Jew was permeated with mitzvos, with Torah, with good deeds. It's embedded in the soul. So when that soul leaves the body, what's happening? That soul no longer functions as a composite to be able to do mitzvahs any longer. That soul no longer exists within this universe. So just as when you see the Torah being burnt, God forbid, you must rend your garments because of the tragedy that what that is no longer exists when the soul being permeated with mitzvahs and with Torah, which is the equivalent of the names of Hashem being embedded in that soul, when it leaves the body, it's no longer here. That soul is no longer here. Therefore, one is witnesses the passing of a person, one rents his garments. That's a Gemara. That's the Talmud of Shabbos, Masech of Shabbos, okay? Now, when a person dies, God forbid, what is the status of the body? What is the body? The body is the receptacle for the neshama. That's what it is. The body facilitated the soul to be able to function as a subject of God living within the context of keeping the, keeping the Torah, performing the mitzvahs. That's what it is. So even though the soul departs, what is the status of the body? The body is holy. Although the soul is no longer there. Because the soul itself was the receptacle, similar as the tefillin. You put it in that ordinary cloth bag. Initially, the bag was ordinary cloth. You could dispose of it, do whatever you want with it. Once you designate it as the location for the tefillin to be, which are innately holy, that bag assumes the status of holiness. Even if you should remove the tefillin, that bag has to be treated with great level of respect because it assumes the sanctity of the tefillin, which that was, was its location. Identically, the body being the location to be able to facilitate the action of the soul, although the soul departs, what, what was the body? The body is similar to a mantle of a Sefer Torah. If the mantle becomes worn, it has to be buried. Because since it accommodated the Sefer Torah, it's similar to the bag with the tefillin, it assumes the sanctity of the Sefer Torah. That's what it is. So a Jew, every time we do a mitzvah, what are we doing? We keep further sanctifying ourselves. Why? Because the act of doing a mitzvah, we're doing an act of mitzvah which innately has holiness. So we're engaging multiple multiple times in Kedusha. Every mitzvah is asher kidshonu so How does God sanctify us? We're sanctified by doing his mitzvahs. So if you do a mitzvah once, you put a dollar bill in the stock box. It's a dollar bill. That's what we did one act. But if you do multiple, you put four quarters in there. Or you put a hundred pennies in there. You've done that act of charity multiple times. Although it's going to the same course, it doesn't make a difference. It's like a person puts a dollar in today and put a dollar in tomorrow. The separate nits of tzedakah, right? Dollar one, dollar two, right? You put in a quarter, then you choose you want to put in another quarter. Second quarter is what? You're doing another act of mitzvah. Every time you do an act of mitzvah, you become sanctified. Every word of Torah we, 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 we articulate. We're doing another mitzvah of study of Torah. Tam Torah Kulam. Each word, as I always mention, name it, Vilna Gon, 
is a positive commandment, which is the equivalent of all 613 commandments. So when you say those words and when you think them, you comprehend them, and you grasp them, you're sanctifying your mouth by verbalizing it. You're sanctifying your mind, your brain. Your brain becomes sanctified. Because the brain is being utilized in the context of what? Of comprehension, of Torah. Now, it's very interesting now. The, if not for, the brain is the whole, the neurological system of the body is the brain. So the brain is, is spiritualized because it comprehends and it's immersed and it's focused only on this Torah thought, primarily on that. So if the brain now sends messages to the, to the body that every functional body is dependent on the brain, from where are those messages coming from? From a location that was sanctified, that was consecrated. How? Because the mind was used to understand and comprehend Torah thought, which innately there's nothing, nothing holier than the Torah itself. I once said, the Talmud tells us in two locations, when the child begins speaking, the father has to teach him two verses. The first verse he has to teach him is Torah Tzivalonu Moshe Marusha Kilas Yaakov. The Torah was commanded us by Moshe. It is what is the it is the heritage of the congregation of Yaakov. It's a verse at the end of the closing parsha portion of the Torah. It's the words of Moshe Rabbeinu. And the second verse he teaches the child is Shema Yisrael Hashem El Ken Hashem Echod. That's the first words they teach a child. Now, the question is, you know, a child says mother, uh, mother goose rhymes. Everybody smiles. It's cute. But you realize when the child says, Torah Tzivilon Moshe Marishki Yaakov, it's not so your child should be cute. And you want your child to be, you know, to be a point of, of attention. You know, it's not that's the reason. There's an obligation of father teaching his child. Now, the question is, when the child starts speaking, that child has no relevance to comprehending what he's saying. Just mouthing words. It's like a parrot. Parrot parrots words. The child learns words one at a time and parrots the words. What is the value of this? If the child has no relevance to understand what it's about, what's the point of teaching the child these two verses? Torah Tzivilon and Moshe Mosh Shekilas Yaakov. The words, what they mean is it encompasses the Torah, the world in its entirety. The Torah its entirety. The world was created for that. And who is the master of the university of the universe? Shema Yisrael Hashem El Kein Echod. That's the imp. That's the universality. That's God, one and only. Okay. But if the child doesn't understand it, what's the point? So what I had once explained was the brain function of speech. When it starts developing, you have to sanctify that function of the brain. Because all functions going forward, speech, what is it rooted in? It's founded on that sanctification of the brain, which was the verse which encompasses the Torah's entirety which also, which represents the objective of creation. That's the first impact on the brain in terms of developing speech. And what's the second verse? Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkein Hashem Echod. This is the ultimate. God's the Almighty. The child has no understanding what those words mean. It doesn't make a difference. But the function of speech, which is part of the brain function, the initial function, where does it begin? What is it rooted on? What's the foundation? The foundation is something which is nothing comparable to that. It encompasses all existence in terms of its dimension of holiness and in terms of its representation of eternity. That's what it is. You know, you teach a child, you know, there's a custom when a Jew passes a mezuzah, at least once a day, you touch the mezuzah and you kiss it. A Sefer Torah passes by, by you, 
you kiss the Sefer Torah, or you go up, you approach it, and you kiss the Sefer Torah. What's the value of this? So, you know, before Kol Nidre on Yom Kippur, we say Kol Nidre, it's the nullification of the vows. In the mouse it is printed, it's called Tefillah Zakam. It's a prayer. It's a few pages. And that, and it was authored, authored by the Chayodom. Chayodom was a student of the, of the Vilna Gon. And we say over there, if you look, if you have an art scroll mouse, you can see the translation, that God has endowed us with many faculties. We speak about the power of speech. And we speak about speech was given to us to study Torah. To say, sing the praises of God. And what did we use speech for? We, we misused it. We embezzled it. We used it to say untruths. We used it to speak Loshon Hara. We, spoke, we use it to say, speak about subject matter on Shabbos, which is inappropriate. Because a person is not supposed to discuss business on Shabbos. Something which relates to their weekday. Rather than studying Torah, we commit ourselves with the power, we're going to study Torah. But he says over there that the mouth that has been sanctified, when we kiss the mezuzah and we kiss the Sefer Torah, when you kiss the Sefer you sanctify your mouth. If the Torah is holy, and you show, you kiss it, which is an expression of its value, what you esteem, what you revere, that brings about a sanctification. Your mouth, which is just speaks ordinary words, but that that you allowed your lips to touch the safe Torah, you put your hand on it and put it to your lips to show, to express your endearment towards it, that brings about a sanctification. So therefore the Ramam says anything we do which is mitzvah-oriented, every time we engage, it brings about a certain degree of sanctification. So if you're able to do something multiple times, it's not you're just repeating the same thing. What's the point? The point is, but every time you engage, it's a new, it's a, it's a new level of sanctification. And it, and it impacts and it's cumulative. And when it accumulates, you develop other senses. Because now you have a degree of holiness. You're building an aura. or has nothing with other people's recognizing it. But the person's able to relate to certain concepts and internalize them only because of this level of sanctification. So now he speaks about setting up a gemach. Free loan. You know, you could set the gemach. You could only borrow from this gemach, from this free loan, $50,000. And all the money it has in this free loan is $50,000. So you can take $50,000 and lend it out to give each person a $50 loan and you can lend a lot of people. Or you can find one wealthy man who wants to do an investment. He needs $50,000 for a down payment. You fulfilled the same mitzvah, you lent him the money. But factually, and even if he needed the money, Somehow he fell short and he needed just to cover his, make ends meet. But if you lend that 50,000 to multiple, multiple poor people, you've done the mitzvah multiple times. The end result, you've done many times, multiple times, you, you performed the, the positive commandment. Each time you fulfill that positive commandment, there's an effect, a positive effect. It's called sanctification. But if you lend that money to one individual, you'll need the one act of sanctification. So he says, if you have a gemach and you open it to the community, that would, as long as it's a credible borrower, he's he qualifies to borrow. That's number one. What about if you're away and you have this functioning free loan and you have somebody actually managing it? You don't have to be there. One person's on vacation. Person is sleeping. There's somebody always to call or to beat, and the money will be available. Therefore, as a result of that, it's an ongoing generator. It generates mitzvahs continuously. But as an individual, if you have to be approached, it's not so simple. You may be preoccupied. You may not be available. You may not be here, period, at all. Therefore, his advice is, Set aside every once in a while a few, he says, rubles, 
which is not a lot of money, or a person who has more substantial, put away something more substantial, and you designate it, that's for the free loan. Anybody who qualifies, credible loan, borrower, he's, he's qualified and eligible to take money from that. I mentioned in the past there's an argument between the Rambam, Maimonides, and Nachmanides. If Tfilah, if the prayer service, is it a Torah obligation to pray once a day, or is it only rabbinical? If you pray, God listens. But do you have an obligation to pray on a Torah level? Rambam says Tfilah, once in a 24 hour period, is a Torah obligation. Nachmanides says no. You have no obligation to pray whatsoever, but if you pray, God is attentive to your prayer. That's the argument. She would say, if it's if it's a Torah obligation, what is it? It's to acknowledge God that he's the provider. Yet the Rambam says, let's see, just say the first blessings of the Amida. Who is God? Great, powerful, awesome. Resurrects the dead, everything. Holy those who created are holy, so and so forth. And you leave out the supplication blessings. You don't request anything of God. And you say the closing blessings, which is the thank you. Modib, we say thank you to God. And we acknowledge everything is determined by what he wills. But you don't ask for anything. Rambam says, although he said the introductory blessings, he said the closing blessings, if you did not ask God for anything, one does not fulfill his obligation of prayer on a Torah level. So the question is why? I acknowledge God as great, powerful, awesome, resurrects the dead, provides life, sustains everything. And then I say, thank you, God, for everything you've given me. But if you don't ask God for intelligence, for healing, for whatever it may be, for livelihood, one does not fulfill his Torah obligation of prayer. The question is, why not? He's asking it with the, the utmost level of sincerity. He's acknowledging it. He didn't ask. So what I always say is, could you imagine a bank puts an ad in the paper? It's public knowledge. Everybody here is, uh, is aware of this. You can borrow as much money as you want from the bank, interest-free, as long as eventually you pay up, but there's no due date. Who's not going to that bank to borrow? And even if they go, it's purely for the amusing part of it. It's not a reality. It's not reality. Because if, if you have that kind of money, unlimited amounts, interest-free, without a due date, pay whenever you can, who's not going to the store to borrow? Who's not going to the bank to borrow? You say, so if we say the Amida, God is the God of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, great, powerful, awesome, so on and so forth, sustains life with chesed, everything, resurrects the dead. God, you know, I need nothing. And you don't make any request. What does it say? You know what that says? It's lip service. Of course, if you really believe Whatever you said in terms of that acknowledgement, he is what that is. What he is, how do you not ask? The bank is giving away money for nothing. How do you not take it? God has said, I'm, if I'm that, it means I could heal you. I could sustain you. You just have to ask. Why aren't you asking? Because all you said were words. You really didn't mean what you said. Because if you would have embraced and internalized what you said, there's no way you could have stayed away and not asked for the healing, not asked for the down download intelligence. Not ask for the livelihood. How, how do you not? The answer is, it's not real. It's purely going through the motions. That's all it is. I'd just like to get back to what I said. Why, when you set a place to pray, why are, you, why are you considered humble? Why is that humility? Why is that expression of humility in your chosid? So the Nod de Behudo, I told you, authored this work. It's called Tzlach. He writes, every time we do a mitzvah, we become sanctified, and the location where we, where we do the mitzvah, we sanctify the location. So let's say a person always says the Amida in one location, 
every time you use that location, that means you utilize that location for you to pray to God, that have, have that audience. That location assumes a status, a status of holiness. And you pray again, it advances. And as long as you pray there, you're continually increasing the intensity of that holiness. So a person says, so why do you always go back to the same location? And why? Because as much as I'm able to focus, as much as I'm able to speak openly to God, but factually is, if you're truly humble, you need all the assistance you could get that God should accept your supplication. So if you're, if you're humble, you know what you do? The location itself is holy. You pr I'm praying in a holy place. Because all the times I've prayed, I've said Damida, I sanctified the location. That's the concept of Mokum Kavua. By always praying in the same location, you're continuously infusing the location, location, exposing it to mitzvah. As a result of that, location is holy. When I pray, I want to be there because I need that assistance of holiness to get my su supplication over the hump. Otherwise, can't get there. That is the booster rocket, so to say. But you have to be humble. And who do we learn from? We learn from Avram Avinu. Before Sodom and Amor was destroyed, he understood, he prayed. Once it's destroyed, people say, yeah, he's praying, but he really, it's purely lip service. He really doesn't, he really doesn't mean it because he can't make a difference. No, it does make a difference. There's a famous Chinuch, just then with this. The Chinuch writes by the Korban Pesach, the Paschal Lamb, every Jew is obligated to eat minimally the volume of an olive of meat of the Paschal Lamb. However, all, though marrow is considered meat, you're not permitted to break the bone of the Paschal Lamb to extract the marrow, which is meat. That's what Torah says. The meat on the bone, you could strip. But the meat, which is the, the marrow in the bone, to break it, to take it out, you're not permitted to. Okay? So the Chinuch, who's a codifier, asks, what's wrong if I break open the bone and suck out the marrow? Why? Why is it a problem? So he explains, there's a rule of thumb, a man is a product of his actions. And he says, a person who's a Russia, and you compel him and force him to do over an extended period of times, time, acts of righteousness, you're going to see a transformation. He will become a tzaddik. The Russia will become a tzaddik, although he's forced to do actions of righteousness because a person is a product of his actions. You take a tzaddik and you force him over time, continues to do acts of evil. Eventually, he will become evil. Because a man is a product of his actions. That's the famous word from the Chinuch. So I'm saying, whatever we do, they were going to the extreme. Tzaddik to Russia, Russia to Tzaddik. But even within Tzaddik, every moment we could upgrade, we could advance ourselves. So by doing things multiple times, what are we doing? It's a continuous re-sanctification. And the capacity for sanctification is, is endless. As much as we sanctify ourselves, we're not sure if we ever met the ultimate grade of sanctification. So therefore, we have an obligation continues to do it, to become to be Asher Kshan Mitzvah The mitzvahs are there to sanctify us. Okay, I think we'll stop here today.